is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's two minutes past eight. Welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question here on LBC. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel, 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 or say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. And of course, you can watch us on Global Player. And the four beautiful faces that you will be watching over the course of, and I exclude myself from that, obviously, over the course of the next hour, uh, comprise of Sophia Gaston, Head of Foreign Policy and UK Resilience, for the policy exchange think tank. Alex Crowley is a former political advisor to Boris Johnson while he was Prime Minister. Uh, Joe Phillips, political journalist and commentator. And Lord Darroch, Kim Darroch, crossbench peer, who is a former British ambassador to the US, UK permanent representative to the EU and national security advisor. Lots of calls already coming in, but we can always do with more. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. And our first question comes from Rob in Maidstone. Rob, hi, what would you like to ask? Good evening. Good, good evening, Ian. So my question's quite simple. Why did Suella Braverman put gay people on the front of her list? When last year, from our own figures, they accounted for 1% of asylum seekers and 621 people. Um, Joe Phillips. Yeah, good question, Rob. Um, <clears throat> because she's just flying a flag and throwing red meat to the right wing of the Conservative Party. Um, and all the time she's getting the headlines and people like us, programmes like this, talking about it. Nobody's actually talking about the real crisis in um, asylum, which is the 175,000 people who are sitting in limbo waiting for their claims to be processed. Um, and I think the fact that she chose to talk about um, gay people and put this rather peculiar thing there between persecution and discrimination... I mean, at what point, if you are in Uganda, let's say, or you're a woman in Afghanistan, does discrimination become persecution? Well, I suppose the simple answer to that is if, if somebody fears for their life, um, and in Uganda, a lot of gay people are Absolutely. fearing for their life, and yes. in countries like Iran, I, mean, I think, does she not have a point, though, that d there is a difference between discrimination and persecution? There are plenty of Western European countries, in Eastern or Eastern European countries, where gay people could be discriminated against, but they're not necessarily persecuted. No, but if you're in a country where that discrimination starts and then it leads to either life imprisonment or other um, interventions or in some cases, you know, capital punishment in parts of Nigeria, um, then, you know, that discrimination takes a nasty turn, doesn't mm. it? You know, the, the women in Afghanistan, girls who are not allowed any education at all and are more and more discriminated against, but actually I would argue that's a form of persecution. Um, Kim Darrick, let's come to you. I thought it was a misjudgment by her to put gay people and women at the top of her list of people who might not might not um, uh, have a case for, for asylum. There are, I think, more than 60 um, national jurisdictions where um, private, consensual relationships, gay relationships, are criminalised. There's more than a dozen, I think, where... The death penalty is a possible, possible um, consequence, um, and in these half a dozen countries, the death penalty has been used against gay people for this. So, this is not a small problem, and I mean that's not discrimination. <laughs> that's much worse than discrimination. Similarly, as Joe has just said, if you look at uh, discrimination against women, I mean, if you're a, a girl in Afghanistan and denied education, that goes beyond discrimination. That's denying you a fair chance in life. So it's odd for me that she chose um, those two those two examples. The 1951 Refugee Convention, which is what she's attacking and saying should be rewritten. Look, obviously that was a long time ago and the world has changed. But the point I'm making about that is it's 145 countries have signed up to it. There is absolutely no chance, in my view, of renegotiating, getting a consensus amongst all those countries to change it. So however imperfect it may be, You've got to make the best of it and that's what most people are doing and if you want to uh to, I mean, what she's really i suspect thinking about is leaving it not renegotiate it because that's impossible 
And that would be quite a renegade thing to do. I mean, this was something that, Lind that, that Winston Churchill was one of the, the, the people who created it, who supported it, who wanted it. And um, you know, 145 countries signed up. Is Britain really a country that doesn't want to be part of this? How does this work within government? Who sees this kind of speech before it's delivered? Because she wouldn't just write it and then go off and deliver it. It would have to go through some sort of clearance process, wouldn't it? Well, yes, yes and, and Would you no. have expected to have had sight of this in your previous uh, Yes, role? I would. I would. But, you know, sometimes these things but work. How much and of it sometimes... would you have crossed out? <laughs> <laughs> I would have crossed out the stuff saying, um, you know, we should just go ahead and renegotiate because it's just not credible as an argument, I think. Um, and then I would have, I would have, you know, put a big question mark over whether this was either sensible policy or good politics for the reasons for the reasons I've explained. And you know, it may be imperfect, and it may be, you know, uh, it was a long time ago, but it's the only thing we're going to have, and we've got to work with it. And that's the view that most countries take of it. It, it does seem odd to be opening up a new front, where she clearly would love to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. Yes. Um, but to then say, well or implicitly say, she didn't actually directly say, well, maybe if, if we can't renegotiate this, we need to leave this as well. I mean, that's quite something. I mean, uh, I'm not one to, to know much about the internal politics of the Conservative Party or how this plays with the party membership or whatever. Um, it's a bit odd if to make a speech like this actually over in America, I think. Uh, I mean, Americans have lots of problems on their southern border, but I don't think this, this will land with the... Um, right-wing think tank quite well, but I'm not sure it'll get a huge amount of, of wider support than that. Um, but I suspect there must be some, some you know, domestic politics in this and domestic political positioning. Alex Crowley, you know a lot about the Conservative Party and positioning within it. What, do you, what do you make of it? <laughs> um, uh, well, I think in the Home Secretary's uh, perhaps exuberance to get a headline and to position herself for the next Conservative leadership contest next year, um, I think she may have overreached a little bit. Actually, I don't think it was good politics. If you, if you uh, assess her objective today as positioning herself with the Tory membership, and that's been a, a charge that has been levelled against her, I actually don't think that works very well with the Tory membership. Well, on the basis that they're so guilty about voting for Liz Truss, they'd, they'd go for the opposite <laughs> next time. No, they were quite happy to vote for Liz Truss, and obviously they, they not, saw no, the you can't find a single one of them that did. Yeah, they were happy at the time. Uh, obviously, obviously not subsequently, not many people were. Um, uh, actually, I don't think so, and a simple reason is that most people assume the Tory membership is this kind of this kind of rabble of older people who, who, who think, well, things were much better in the yesteryear and, 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 and you know, and people accuse them of, of holding uh, racist views and all the rest of it. Actually, that's not my experience of the Tory membership. Um, I'm sure it's not yours either, Ian. I think making a speech and allowing the headline and encouraging the headline, let's be honest, to be about the issue of gay people and whether uh, uh, them being discriminated or persecuted against these grounds for, valid grounds for asylum, uh, I, I, th I don't think that plays very well. I think there's a broader argument she missed today, which would have played well with the Conservative membership, which is the kind of the elephant in the room of our immigration and asylum policy, which is this country has no ability to control its borders because it doesn't have the powers to do so. Uh, we are in the ridiculous situation where a government has given itself powers to uh, remove people coming over on small boats and has no ability to enforce it because of the wider issues with the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which um, the Home Secretary is a critic of, and many other serious people are critics of, not just members of the Conservative right. Um, uh, uh, that is the real problem she could have addressed, but instead we have this sort of very odd side issue with the UN uh, Refugee uh, Convention, which is, as Lord Derek says, is, is perhaps something of a sideshow, actually, uh, on this point. Sophia? I mean... I don't even understand how it's good politics to lead with a focus on women or LGBT communities because as someone who does a lot of public opinion research I, and I've done in-depth focus groups specifically on views about asylum and, you know, including at the, the height of the small boats crisis earlier in the year, I, uh, people do make differentiations about the types of 
um, migrants and, and asylum seekers that they're more favorable towards. And women and LGBT communities are some of the most highly, um, you know, the, the, they're the most favorably seen amongst people making distinctions about these things. So um, that seems strange to me, um, because even if you're sort of appealing to those differentiations, you're going to the ones that people uh, tend to be more favorable to anyway. So that's strange. I do think there is a really important conversation that needs to be had about refugee and asylum management. Um, but it seems so apparently the case that this is going to have to be a pan-European conversation. And I think there is a conversation to be had about the conventions and, and the Court of Human Rights and so on. But, you know, we also need to be really stepping up our efforts. And I think the European political community, which is this new sort of... Um, full regional grouping, which which it has the EU in it, but also other European countries, including the UK, we're hosting that next year. That's exactly the sort of forum where we should be starting to have some of these conversations, because unless we come up with a full regional model here for how we're going to manage this, and this is going to have to include relations with different source countries and so on, and, and thinking about how we put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, I just don't think this is going to be efficacious whatsoever. I mean, we can sit here and say, we'll p pull up the drawbridge, which, you know, I think would be a disaster for a number of reasons and it's just not even practically enforceable. Um, or we can be trying to put our efforts into working out what a really practical solution that encompasses the whole of the region and is going to actually future-proof us for a situation that we know is going to only become more and more prominent. I mean, look at what's happening with climate change and so on. We know mass migration is something that we're going to be having to deal with for a long time. So what's our development offer? What's our pan-European refugee and asylum policy offer? These are the sorts of conversations I think we should be having. So have a quick word about what she said about multiculturalism, where she was implying that it's been a complete failure in this country, which we, we in the last hour we had several people who were immigrants to this country say, "Well, it's absolute rubbish." We we think that this country has been brilliant at sort of integrating people. I mean, obviously there there are exceptions to that, but um, I mean, was that a political misjudgment, or, or was it yet another dog whistle to the people that she wants to hear the dog whistle? Kim, well, I don't agree with with her judgment. I'm much closer to, to the view you just described. I mean, I don't think it's perfect at all, and there's obviously things that can be improved. But um, I mean, even if you look around Europe, I think there are, that our model uh, has been you know, as successful as any and more successful than most. So um, I don't think it's been a disaster at all. It doesn't mean to say it can't be, it can't be improved. As to why she's done it, I mean, my only answer, but from no knowledge of her, particularly, I don't, never met her, that it's another piece of political positioning and an attempt to appeal to people who she thinks might you know, might be part of her support in the future. And, I mean, you're ambassador in the US. British politicians love to go make speeches in Washington. It's sort of almost a rite of passage for potential party leaders. Um, why, why do they do that? Um, there are three uh, quite right-wing institutes over there which are particularly welcoming to... Um, to uh, to politicians from 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 the centre right, and so I mean certainly in my time there, um, a lot of those who came ministers who came through wanted to go off and at least meet with the Hudson Institute or or with um, the, the the Enterprise Institute, and that was fine. And they wanted to make speeches there. I do think you have to be careful from whichever political party you come from to go off. To America and make a speech which is not about international affairs, not about international politics, international issues, um, but which is essentially focused uh, on getting messages across back home. It's just a bit odd to do that. And whenever one was asked about it as a civil servant, you would say, "Well, if you want to make that sort of speech, Mister, I would do it somewhere in in the UK." Well, she, uh, Sophie, you have American politicians coming to do speeches at policy exchange, don't you? So it works both ways. Absolutely, and I mean, I think there's a certain segment of, uh, you know, the Washington think tank community mm. that's absolute anglophiles. I mean, you know, there's obviously the Margaret Thatcher Center right. for Freedom. Mm -hmm. There's all, <laughs> you walk into um, think tanks over there, and and you know, the enormous pictures of Margaret Thatcher hanging on the wall, mm. and 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 so on. And and here there are plenty of think tanks. It's quite moving, actually. They seem to. <laughs> oh, for goodness' sake! They seem to like her more than we did. 
He's going to um, go all moist eyed uh, in a minute. Not, not just eyes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what? <laughs> Multiculturalism. <laughs> Multiculturalism. No, I, I mean, I think, you know, of course there are bits that could be better and there are going to be tensions. But I think, broadly speaking, for heaven's sake, we're a small island. Islands will attract people from all over the world. It's inevitable. And I think we've managed perfectly well, and I think, by and large, we do. Alex? I don't think it's multiculturalism that has failed. Um, I personally take it as... Uh, a, a really positive sign that there are lots of people around the world that see our country as a place that they can prosper. And, and that is a vote of confidence in our country. We do our own country down quite mm. a lot, particularly now. You were listening to me about 15 minutes ago, weren't you, when I said that at the end of the... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't, but I'm glad that we're on the same we page are on that. absolutely in. on the same but page. It's, but there is a difference between multiculturalism and the practical consequences of mass immigration, where we have not built the infrastructure yeah. in, this in this country to support it, and that's been an active And decision. whose fault might that be? Possibly the Home Secretary's. Uh, it's it, it's everyone's fault. It's every, honestly, it's every politician's fault who has been in power over the last twenty to thirty years. That's quite that's quite a claim. Surely it has to be those in charge of the Home Office that have failed to build the infrastructure. Because I mean, it's not it's not as if this has happened overnight. No, it's not as if it's happened overnight. But it's it's broadly been the policy of successes of successive British governments to encourage mass legal immigration, uh, separate to illegal immigration, yeah. which is what we're discussing with, with asylum. We have not, for example, built anywhere near enough houses in this country to support the growing population that we wish to see. Well, we may have a question on that. We certainly had one last night. Um, oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel. It's eighty minutes past eight. This is LBC.
Britain's Conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. Let me just remind you who's on our panel. Lord Darrock, uh, Sophia Gaston from Policy Exchange, Alex Crowley. What is, I've, I keep describing you as former advisor to Boris I know, Johnson. I know, I know. Exactly. What, what's your current role? Uh, my current role is I run a communications agency called Shared Voice. And what does that do? Communicate. Uh, so we, we help businesses uh, communicate better with people uh, and we also help them mobilise people to be on their side. And Joe Phillips, political journalist and commentator, and I mentioned before, former advisor to Paddy Ashdown, mm. much missed by us all, isn't he? Yes, absolutely. Yes, really missed. And right. I, I, particularly in the field of foreign affairs, actually. Yeah, and he, he was somebody who people say, oh, well, we haven't got the politicians like we used to have. Well, they don't make them like that anymore. Well, they certainly don't. And I have to say, um, as Kim's here, that we had a wonderful trip um, that I was talking about with Paul Tyler only the other day when we went to... Um, America and we stayed at the embassy um, at, you weren't there then, you were somewhere <laughs> else but it was absolutely fantastic and Paddy and Ming Campbell went off to do very important things with defence people and you know men with black Labradors and sitting on <laughs> you know and flags flying and all that sort of stuff and Archie Kirkwood and Paul Tyler and I went shopping, we had a great time <laughs> This is an insight into what's ha what happens on political trips. It was lovely. No, I could tell you about uh, my trip to Washington, but we haven't got time. Uh, let's go to Madea in Brixton. Hello, Madea. Yes, hello. Hi, Ian. Um, I'm actually calling for the first time. So, uh, my question to the uh, Thank you. Thank you. My question to the panel is that if uh, Joe Biden is happy to stand uh, on the picket line next to the striking um, car workers, why is Keir Starmer and the rest of the front bench labour so afraid of the striking unions, the doctors, the nurses, and, and all the others. Because not only did they not stand on the picket line with the nurses and doctors and railway workers, um, any front bencher that did so was threatened with the sack. And I think they did they did sack one, didn't they? Um, Angela Rayner's part, whose name has completely escaped me. Um, Steve, mm. what's his name? The, Sam Tarry. I got there in the end. Okay. Um, well, now, the, the American president has joined car workers from the United Auto Workers Union of Car Makers at a picket line in Michigan within the last 90 minutes or so and has endorsed their demands for a 40% pay rise. He's the first serving president ever to join a picket line. Now, this comes after a poll at the weekend gave Donald Trump a 10-point advantage over Biden with the gap among the under-35s at 20 points. Kim? Um, why has Biden done it? Look, Joe Biden has a long record um, of support for an interaction with the trade unions. He's been in politics. Uh, he's been a senator since his 30s, and he's now 80. So that's 50 years. And uh, so he's grown up um, with the unions, as it were, and been close to them. And he represented Delaware for a long, long time. And that's, you know, that's, that's a kind of Rust Belt state, heavily unionized. So... Although it's 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 a departure for him to actually go onto a picket line, um, his relationship with with the uh, with the trade unions is the stuff of, of record and, and of history. Um, whether it'll play for him uh, in in American politics, I don't know. But it's not one of these strikes like health workers or doctors, or whatever, that has a huge impact on the whole population. So it's not like joining a picket line uh, outside a hospital or something like that, I think. Um, in terms of the, uh, the latest opinion polls, just briefly on that, um, Biden was always ahead of Trump in the 2020 race. Throughout the whole thing, throughout the whole year of 2020, he had a lead in the opinion polls. And so it's, it's alarming in a way that they have been neck and neck, or now the latest one, although there are all sorts of outliers in American polling, um, gives, gives Trump a significant lead. It's also, in a way, sort of difficult to understand, given that Trump has 90 indictments against him as counting, and counting, and at least one of those, my guess is, will come to trial before the um, Republican convention in July 2024. Um, but here's the thing. 70% of Americans think Biden shouldn't run in 2024. They think he's too old. Every time he stumbles, whether by a confused answer to a press conference question or physically stumbles, falls, bike or whatever, people worry about whether this guy is actually going to be around for the whole of the next term. 
and they wonder if they're really electing Kamala Harris, who isn't very popular. Why that should turn them towards Donald Trump, I'm not sure, given that Donald <coughs> Trump is saying increasingly deluded things out on Truth Social and whenever he, he's in front of a microphone. But what a choice the American people have. I mean, 80-year-old Joe Biden and 76-year-old Donald Trump with 90 indictments against him. I mean, you couldn't, Mike, you couldn't make it up. Mm. Um, Joe, let's come to you. The... It, it, Keir Starmer has been very careful to distance himself from strike action in this country. Clearly, Joe Biden doesn't feel the need to do the same thing. Do, do you sense that Keir Starmer might look at this and think, well, maybe maybe I didn't call that No, right? I don't. And I think the, the reasons that Kim has explained, this is not about the public sector. And I think that is the problem for anybody from the shadow cabinet to go on a picket line with public sector workers who are asking a government, in effect, that they they might be in the future to fund, in the doctor's case, whatever it is they're asking for, 15%. Um, I think that puts him in a very difficult position. I mean, personally, I think Keir Starmer is far too cautious. And if he could somehow or other find a way to channel, you know, the passion of Neil Kinnock with the vision and clear-sightedness of Tony Blair in his first term, he might be doing something than being just a better alternative to this shabby bunch of crooks and con men um but i i think to go i i think it's a completely different thing you're talking about her majesty's government <laughs> I, think, majesty's I think i think she might have been. <clears throat> yeah i am okay sophia I think the key point is the distinction between the public and private sector. Um, but i also think there's something about uh the spectre of Jeremy Corbyn that still hangs over Starmer and obviously his bid for number 10 has been very much couched in, um, you know, needing to very much create a distinction from this man who wanted to nationalise everything and sent a shiver down our spines in doing so. Um, so I think the the sort of desire to shake off that idea that there is a sort of um, kind of big statist um, skeleton hiding in Labour's closet, I think that's very important. But also with the US comparison, um, Britain and, and the United States, I think a lot of Comparisons have been made in the sort of Trump Brexit moment about both countries sort of turning their backs on globalization and so on. But we've had a very different conversation here, actually, in the substance of our economic model. And we remain a country that is absolutely pursuing a free trade policy with the world and, in fact, is refusing to engage in these conversations about industrial policy that all of our other allies are having. Whereas in the US, you can't talk about trade at all. There's a whole murder on that. And so this sort of protectionism kind of big state um, fever in the US is sort of become a kind of bipartisan consensus between, um, you know, where the kind of Biden administration is at the moment and, and where Donald Trump is. So I think that sort of also does change the dynamics around these sort of questions about unionism too. Alex? Um, there was no chance of Keir Starmer ever joining a picket line because that would mean having to believe in something. Um, uh, and, and that's not something he has yet demonstrated to the British public. I'm sure the man does, um, uh, and I'd be interested to hear it at some point, particularly before he gets elected rather than after he gets elected so voters know what they're, what they're voting for. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, Donald Trump, it doesn't surprise me one bit that he is so far ahead of Joe Biden. It, it, it appalls us all that Donald Trump, the man with, what, 19 uh, charges, uh, federal charges against him, etc., the man who led the insurrection, the man who, we, who, who is just awful in all sorts of respects, and that is all true, by the way, um, it really still shocks us that he is popular in America and we still refuse to engage with the reasons why. Um, little, little fact from 2016 for you. Um, there was a surprisingly large number of voters who voted for Obama that voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And until we understand that, we have no chance of understanding why he continues to be popular. There's no coincidence that Joe Biden, in a panic, let's face it, is going to stand on the picket line with workers in uh, Michigan. I think it was Michigan, wasn't it? 
because um, the Democratic Party and the Democratic establishment have, over many, many, many years, failed their working class base, uh, just as the Labour Party in this country failed its working class base, which was part of the reason why we had the 2019 victory. Uh, and the political class as a whole in this country and the United States uh, in the view of most ordinary voters, I'm not talking about extreme voters, I'm talking about mainstream voters, um, has failed to deliver on living standards. It's failed to deliver on, on, on the basic function of any political movement, which is to provide you and your family with a better future. But it is astonishing, um, as Kim said, that, you know, that vast country has is basically looking at the choice between two elderly men, one of whom is probably going to be... But we've said this now for three presidential elections in a row. I know, I know. But it, but, but first but, it was Trump versus a, a Clinton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is and absolutely before that, it was a Bush had to be involved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely staggering. Well, should we turn to the former US ambassador well, for the UK should, to answer the, the, this particular question? Why, why is that? I'm mean, very well, we have to go to the news in about a minute. Right. Um, look, it is the most appallingly difficult process to go through the primaries and then through the election race. It's, you know, I mean, our elections are six weeks. These are, you know, 18 months in effect. Um, you're absolutely taken apart by the media every day. So it's a really terrifying process. But the real problem, the big problems in life is you need billions of money and everyone has to spend most of their time fundraising and uh, you know the fundraiser the, the, the backers support who they back and uh, if you don't come out on top in the amount of money that your campaign is bringing in you actually have no chance so money plays a big big part in all this but an awful lot of talented politicians in America would never dream of running for the presidency because it is just such an idea terrifying and appalling process. Mm. That's not the only... And by the way, Alex, um, much as I hate to agree with him, is right about... That's twice now. The failure... <laughs> Why do you um, hate to agree with him? He's not well, that objectionable, is he? No, no, no. Not usually, Ian. Not, <laughs> not usually. But he is right that, um, that a lot of the people who voted for Trump were people who had done badly economically, who were living paycheck to paycheck, who could barely make ends meet, and who did worse out of the financial crisis in 2008, when no bankers were sent to prison, a lot of poor people lost yeah. their houses or did really, really badly. And Trump was brilliant in saying, I'm not part of this Washington corrupt elite, you know, I'm a businessman, I'm different, I, I will come in and look after you. And that was an extraordinarily powerful message. More calls in a moment, 0345 6060973. Medea, thank you very much indeed for yours. It's news time at, on LBC at 8.34 with Charlotte Morgan. Campaigners are describing the Home Secretary's comments around refugees as shameful. Speaking in the US today, Suella Bravman said fearing persecution for your sexuality doesn't justify a UK asylum claim. Sir Ed Davey has attacked the Tories' record on health and the economy while closing the Lib Dem party conference. The party leaders also promised to give cancer patients the right to receive treatment within two months. And in the last hour, Tory cabinet minister Sir Alok Sharma has announced he will not stand at the next general election. The former COP26 president has been the Reading West MP since 2010. LBC weather turning drier tonight with showers becoming confined to the far north, a low of five. Storm Agnes bringing rain and strong winds tomorrow, a high of 22. LBC.
Homes. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 973. Strategic consultant. Kim Darrick, Sophia Gaston, Alex Crowley and Joe Phillips with us answering your questions. 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to put a question to the panel. Now, a text question from Simon in Farnborough. Is Keir Starmer right to want to stay as close as we can to the EU when it comes to standards or does this make him an elitist Remainer? A group of business leaders today wrote to The Guardian to say Starmer is right not to want to diverge. Sophia. I think ever since Brexit, we, you know, there's been a question about whether or not we will remain in alignment or whether or not we will diverge. This is going to remain the question for some time. Um, we don't seem to have been very good at actually working out the areas where we could diverge in, in, in a way that would claim us some advantage. There certainly are some of those areas. Um, we haven't acted on many of them. Um, Why? But, uh, well, I think the state's been rather caught up with um, just capacity issues. Uh, you know, I think the Brexit project itself has been so enormous. Uh, we see this with the business department and these they've thousands of laws that have to be looked at. And, you know, time and time again, they're just being rolled over and rolled over. And that's partly because a lot of them are things that we would want to remain as they are anyway. Um, and it's also just because it's an enormous amount of work and you don't want to get rid of something unless you've got something else to put in its place. I mean, the story of a lot of Brexit <laughs> anyway. Um, but I do think, you know, that there is an important question here about our future prosperity. And, you know, I think actually what we've seen is that the government has now pursued a rapprochement with the EU and is continuing to find new areas in which to kind of cooperate anew, whether that's getting us back into Horizon and so on, and I, I fully applaud that. Labour is obviously towing a cautious political line, but uh, it is starting to speak more openly about their intent of, of economic alignment. Um, at the end of the day, the EU remains overwhelmingly our largest trading partner. If we are to continue to prioritise trade with our um, you know, countries that share our values, they're going to be taking, that's a, that's a heck of a lot of those countries are in the EU and they also happen to be our geographical neighbours. So, you know, I, I, it's not at all controversial even amongst the British people to say that we should be pursuing a closer trading relationship with our neighbours. It's It just makes common sense. So the vast majority with opinion polls shows over and over again that people are much are comfortable for the government doing that. So I don't think it is an elitist idea at all. Um, um, but you know, if if they are our largest trading partner, then you know a lot of a lot of this is actually about regulation, standard setting, and so on. Um, and you know, we, alignment means ease; it means less friction. So it's kind of common sense. And uh, frankly, I think whoever's in number ten after the next election is going to be going in that direction. Alex, it's entirely sensible to want to find areas of cooperation with the European Union, obviously. Uh, for all the reasons that, that Sophia just, just outlined. Um, but that's a very different proposition to what's been going on with Keir Starmer over the last few weeks. So very odd things have been happening. Um, suddenly he's, he's off giving a speech in Canada where he's perhaps talking about some of the areas that we might uh, get, get even closer to the EU. A strange policy paper published by the European Commission saying, well, maybe there, there could be different levels of membership and maybe one of those levels could be quite loose. It could include the United Kingdom. And, well, of course, they could take all the rules. They don't get any of the say, of course, but they can take some of the rules. Um, if I were uh, Keir Starmer and my plan was to eventually try and rejoin the European Union, um, I would never admit it. Uh, but what I would do is I would start a process of integration. And I would very calmly say, well, here are all of the areas we can work together and maybe we'll sign up to this deal and we might sign up to that deal and we'll take these rules. And then, of course, people like me would say, well, yes, but you're signing up to the rules, but you don't have any of the influence. Uh, at which point the Prime Minister Starmer says, uh, and I can see this playing out, um, oh, OK, well, maybe, uh, maybe we should have some of the say. Let's rejoin. That's the logic of the argument that he is now starting to very gently but, but roll out. what is illogical, surely, is having spent three years effectively saying, no, I may have been shadow Brexit Secretary, I may have wanted a second referendum, but actually I fully accept Brexit and we're not going to question it. He spent three years doing that, trying to reassure Labour vo or ex-Labour voters, in particular the Red Wall seats, mm -hmm. and being quite successful at it, actually. Mm -hmm. 
and now he's kind of blown it. Joe? Well, I don't think he has blown it, because I think what is quite obvious is that there was never a plan from the Brexit campaign of what we would do if they won. And here we are seven years on, um, there is still great uncertainty for business, for farming, for fishing, for any number of industries and sectors, you know, from musicians who can't travel and artists or selling art or all sorts of things. Um, and I think what people are beginning to see and what is really sad is that you can't have a sensible discussion about how we, in a way, make the best of this absolute dog's breakfast of what we've got. Um, because I think, you know, people are so divided still, and I think that's a tragedy, because it has stopped us being able to have sensible conversations, which is, OK, oh, whoops, didn't Boris Johnson and his cronies recognise the fact that we might suddenly need all of those people who used to come and do the jobs that British people don't do? Oh, whoops, didn't we realise that we, actually it's going to make an awful lot of harder for small businesses to export and import? It's going to add time and cost to absolutely everything which is going to be passed on to the consumer. And quite clearly, as Sophia says, you know, if you're going to trade, your biggest trading partner, you do need to be in alignment with their rules and regulation, because otherwise you're not going to be able to sell them anything. Kim? I think the question of standards is, as has already been said, one of common sense. We do 40% of our trade with Europe, 18% um, with the US, 7% with China, and then go on down. And, you know, if you have different UK national standards to EU standards and different regulations to EU regulations, all you do is load on extra costs for our business because they're still going to be trading with Europe. We're not going to replace Europe with New Zealand and Fiji and the rest of the Pacific. I'm afraid it's always going to be Europe will be our major trading partner. And you may as well stay aligned with them. Otherwise, you're just doing more Which, harm. Which, to be fair, is what the government has largely done. Um, yeah, uh, but but there are still those who talk about the importance of, of future divergence. So I don't think they're committed to regulatory alignment in the way that that Starmer, judging by his his words in uh, in Canada, is. I think it's a good thing that he is. I think it's common sense. By the way, I thought it was a rather good paper that the EU produced. But it's not about creating circumstances for the UK to come. And we think everything is about us in Europe. They've moved on from Brexit. What it's about is preparing the EU for eventual enlargement to take in the Balkan countries and Ukraine. And there'll be a decision on Ukraine maybe this December at the European Council, if not next year. But that's a big, big problem for the EU. And that's why they've created these different tiers of membership. But if one of them happens to suit the UK, well, fine, we should take advantage of it. OK, we will move on in just a moment. It's 8.46. LBC.
Terms apply. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.49. Hassan in Cambridge has one of the more esoteric questions we've ever had on Cross Question, I think it's fair to say. Hassan, hi, go ahead. Yeah, so the Speaker of the Canadian Parliament has just resigned for organising a standing ovation for somebody, someone who served alongside, uh, served under some Nazi uh, officers in Ukraine. Is there a risk that we are arming Nazis in our struggle to push Russia out of Ukraine? And could we be repeating the errors of the 80s where we funded Al-Qaeda against the Russians? Well, the Speaker of Canada's House of Commons has resigned today after MPs gave a 98-year-old Ukrainian called Yaroslav Hunker a standing ovation, and the now former Speaker called him a hero during President Zelensky's visit to the Canadian Parliament. However, this elderly Ukrainian man actually served in the Waffen SS during the... I don't know why, I, I kind of want to laugh at this because it is so bizarre in so many ways. Don't laugh, it's not I'm not, I'm not going to laugh. Uh, during the Second World War under Nazi command... Um, I mean, it's a difficult one, this, isn't it? Because, mm. I mean, clearly, the speaker won't have known of his Waffen SS past when the standing ovation happened. Well, I don't know. I'm not a Canadian. But at least I mean, something I mean, interesting has happened in Canada. That's, he was 98 years old. That's, that's, that's the main news story, Kim. Uh, if the media can discover, I presume it's them who discovered this guy who had a Waffen SS pass, then the speaker or the deputy speaker should have had the staff work done to spot that beforehand and stopped it happening. So I didn't feel great sympathy for him, and I think he should have resigned. On the second part of the question, look, you can't... I mean, there will be people fighting against the Russians who have right-wing nationalist views, um, but we're absolutely right to keep arming Ukraine. Um, what the Russians have done, if you were to let it happen and accept it, then it just throws the whole, uh, you know, post-war system, international rule book out of the window, and it opens up uh, the opportunity for dictators and um, everywhere, including including um, uh, Xi in China with Taiwan, to just you know, move into the neighbourhood and take over whatever they want. It would have been the most appalling precedent and weakness on the West part if we hadn't uh, come in to support Ukraine militarily. We should have done it in 2014 when Crimea fell. Maybe we should have done it back in 2008 when the Russians um, took a chunk of Georgia. But um, no, we have to do it and we have to stick with it because I think Putin will be looking at American politics, noting that both Trump and DeSantis don't favour continuing American aid to Ukraine should they win the election. And he'll be just waiting and waiting mm. and hoping that something changes in American politics in November 2024. Sophia? I think, you know, it's very different to a situation with Al-Qaeda. This is a, a nation state that we are um, supporting. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, the Ukrainian uh, armed forces need every man they can get at the moment. This is a really difficult fight. Um, I have absolutely no qualm about us supporting Ukraine and I wish we could be doing more, frankly, um, because we are in a, you know, a difficult position, not just because it's becoming more protracted, um, but because I'm really concerned about the future of Western support. Um, we, there are, you know, I think here in Britain, we, we sort of tend to imagine that everywhere has the sort of enormous public support as we do here. But actually in many countries, even in Europe, um, there, there's a much more mixed picture amongst the population. And as Kim has uh, referred to in the United States, we are genuinely facing a situation where um, a large chunk of um, the Republican Party is is actively opposed to arming Ukraine and uh, is is threatening to hold up the next deployment of supplies. So um, I think we need to absolutely throw everything we have behind this because uh, it's not an option for us to lose uh, this battle. Well, it's not just the Canadian uh, House of Commons Speaker that's having to apologise now. Um, I wish to apologise to Andy and Barnsley's wife, who is Canadian and has taken great exception to my little quip about something interesting happening in Canada. So, <laughs> Andy's <laughs> wife, I'm very, very sorry. I won't do it again. Do keep listening. Um, Alex and Joe, if you could be quite brief, and then we can fit in one more question. Joe. D well, just quickly, the the, the 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 point about you know Nazis um, and the far right—they are 
everywhere. They're in this country. They're right across Europe. We've seen the, the mood music coming out of Poland because of an election coming, which is really scary because it's right on the uh, border with Ukraine. I think we all have to be mindful. Uh, we should have gone in, certainly in 2014. And if Trump gets elected, then God help us all. On that bombshell, Alex? Uh, I think it's uh, it's a reasonable criticism to or a reasonable question to ask, how long does this go and what is the full extent of our commitment? It's not questioning that we should commit to it. It's a question about where does this end? Uh, and that is going to become a feature of our politics as this horrible mess uh, continues to drag on probably for many years. Right. Uh, let's Hassan, thank you for that. Let's go to Gareth in Matlock. Hello, Gareth. Good evening, uh, Ian. Nice to speak to you. I'll get Hi. quick to the question. So, for your panel, does Rishi Sunak have a mandate to cancel the northern section of HS2? Now, you may or may not be relieved to know that each of you have got 45 seconds on this, Alex. Uh, yes, he does, because he's the Prime Minister, and if we think that this... Uh, the, if this project that is wildly over budget is ever actually going to be delivered, um, that, then I think we're probably living in cloud cuckoo land. True. I don't think Rishi Sunak has a mandate to do anything, frankly. He's there, voted for by 0.12% of the Conservatives. But that is, that is our system. And it yes, I know it is. I know, but... Yeah. He wasn't even voted for by the membership, actually. No, exactly. Let, let, let's, well, no, let's, well, let's no, but, uh, but, I mean, you know, he hasn't got a mandate. He, and he's... Right, he's, HS2, should it go to Manchester? It should have started in Manchester, frankly. Um, the whole thing's an absolute vanity project. It's been badly thought out. You and I know empty stations at Ebbsfleet and Ashford International. We, this country is so bad on infrastructure and the money it's costing, £135 million a week, could be so much better spent. But having got this far, why should the North, that desperately needs investment do without. Well, the real scandal here, I think, is that it's apparently going to not come into Euston. It's going to stop at somewhere I've never heard of, Old Oak Common, and then yeah, people exactly. are going to have to get buses. So it's actually going to take longer yeah. to yes. get to yes. and from Birmingham. Mm. I mean, how does this even happen? Well, it's 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 a terribly managed and conceived uh, infrastructure project. I'm unbelievably embarrassed that it's got to this stage. But, you know, I, I tend to look at this as sunk costs. I, you know, I, I would push ahead um, and try and see it through because I think it's otherwise we'll have this terrifying train to nowhere. And, I, you know, that's just going to be um, an absolute embarrassment. And also just, you that's know... It's a very unkind thing to say about Manchester. Or, or, or Old Oak <laughs> Common, which is a train to nowhere. Exactly, exactly. exactly. I'm West talking London about, deserves a train station exactly, too. Exactly. You know? I'm talking about the obscure West London um, location for this. But... Um, no, I, I, I think we're better off trying to fix this and, and get what we yeah. can from it. Otherwise, we've just spent all that money for naught. Kim, very quickly. Very quickly, Rishi Sunak has the power to cancel it. He wants to. I despair about our doing infrastructure. We used to be great at this kind of thing back in the Victorian age, but now hopeless. Because there is no, no planning system, that's why. Yeah. To be. And there is um, no point in building it just to Birmingham. The whole point of it was that it should go up to Manchester and points north. So if we're not going to do it beyond Birmingham, I think it's... Um, it's a disaster. Gareth, thank you very much for that. Now, Rita in Stoke has our fun question. She says, the latest product to fall victim to shrinkflation is the Galaxy chocolate bar, which is getting 10 grams lighter. To combat so many products sneakily getting smaller, you can make one snack absolutely massive instead. Which one? Alex. It's got to be the whisper. Even though it's mostly air, and I accept that. <laughs> More air. Which means actually you need to make it even bigger to, to compensate for that. <laughs> uh, that I've noticed whispers getting really small. Even the little duo packs used to get a massive duo pack. Now they're tiny, they look really tiny. And I think, and I just, I'm left dissatisfied, Ian, when I eat a whisper now. And I think, I think that would be my choice. Make, make the whisper great again. So you want a massive whisper? <laughs> <Joe>. <laughs> Mars bars have shrunk terribly. And when was yeah. the last time you saw a worn-up whip? I never fancied. No, I think they're disgusting. No. Um, fruit and nut. You know, nowadays you're very lucky if you get half a tiny little raisin that looks like a floor sweeping, or could be a fly. Who knows? <laughs> Yorkie bar raisin bars are much better. Um, Sophia. Toblerone. 
I'm extremely offended by the introduction of level terrain into the Toblerone. <laughs> I, I want a Swiss mountain, you know. I don't, I don't want sort of Yorkshire Dales. So. <laughs> okay. I thought about a, Cab a Cadbury's cream egg being ostrich-sized rather than oh, hen-sized. Oh, oh, but sickly. my conclusion was that uh, the, Ma the Magnum Classic ice cream covered in chocolate. So I've never eaten one without wanting another one straight away. Mint magnums are much better. <laughs> uh, well, on, on that note, so thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Lord Darak, Sophia Gaston, Alex Crowley and Joe Phillips. Tomorrow on the show, we have the businessman Sir Martin Sorrell, the Green Party peer and former leader Baroness Natalie Bennett, David Cameron's former Deputy Chief of Staff, Baroness Kate Fall. Oh, having lots of Lords on there. That's because oh. the House of Commons isn't in session at the moment, isn't it? Oh. And the Interim Director of the Human Rights campaign group Liberty uh, Akiko Hart. So um, prepare your questions for them. Coming up in the next hour we are going to go back to Ed Davies speech at the Liberal Democrat conference today and just talk about one aspect. He spent about 15 minutes talking about cancer care in this country which you might think is odd for a leader speech but it was both moving because he talked about his own family's um, experience. Both of his parents died of cancer uh, when he was a child. Um, so I want to examine more widely the state of cancer care in this country.